now, before I give time to our commencement speaker, let me give a brief introduction about Dolly Kikon. Um, Dolly Kikon is a well-known academician from India's northeastern hill state, Nagaland. She is a senior lecturer at the Anthropology and Development Studies Program, Melbourne University, India. Her work focuses on the political economy of extractive resources, militarization, migration, development initiatives, gender relations, food cultures, and human rights in India. Before coming to the University of Melbourne, Dr. Kikon led an interdisciplinary research project at the Department of Social, Social Anthropology, Stockholm University. Her work focused on the increasing trend of out-migration among upland societies in Northeast India, Prior to obtaining her doctoral degree in anthropology from Stanford University, Dr. Kikon worked as a human rights lawyer and a community organizer in India. Focusing on land rights among tribal communities in Northeast India, her legal advocacy works extensively dealt with constitutional provision, Article 371A, with regard to land and resource ownership, as well as the sixth schedule of Indian constitution that deals with autonomy arrangements for securing ethnic rights and guarantees in Northeast India. Her human rights advocacy work continues to focus on the repealing of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act 1958, an extra constitutional regulation that provides impunity to armed forces in India. From 2020 to 2022, she holds a joint appointment as a senior research advisor at the Australia India Institute in Melbourne. Dr. Kikon is the author of Life and Dignity, Women's Testimonies of Sexual Violence in Dimapur, Nagaland, and Living with Oil and Coal, Resource Politics and Militarization in Northeast India. Together with Bang Ji Carlson, she has co-authored Living the Land, Indigenous Migration and Effective Labor in India. Her forthcoming book, co-authored with Duncan Magdura, Ceasefire City, Militarism, Capitalism and Urbanism in Dimapur is slated for release in January 2021. We are delighted and honored to have Dr. Dolly Kikon as our commencement speaker today. Ma'am, please take the time. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. What a delight. So when I was offered the privilege to join the Tetsu family, am I loud enough? I think I usually have problems uh, sometimes not being loud enough. So is that okay? Can someone give me a thumbs up? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, let's get this going. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, to the principal of Tetsa College, Dr. P.S. Lauren, all the faculty members and the administrative staff, thank you for inviting me to address the graduating class of 2020. Hello, graduating class. How are you all feeling? What a day, right? What a joyful day. A very warm greeting to you all. And thank you for making me a part of this important day in your life and for giving me the privilege to reflect together on this very important transition. This is a defining moment in your life and you will reflect back on this day, this moment, the beginning of a new journey, like many of your teachers say, and of many, many journeys altogether. Your faculty of Tetsu College, alumni and family of students studying and graduating from this distinguished institute, I feel honored that you consider my life and my journey as something that might inspire and instill hope in the class of 2020. I feel blessed and humbled when I reflect on my own journey so far. I am zooming in from Australia today, as you know. I work at the University of Melbourne and I got my PhD from Stanford University in California. Then I did my postdoctoral fellowship at the Stockholm University, Department of Social Anthropology in Sweden. For a little girl from Nagaland who grew up with a single mom, struggling to make ends meet, this has not been a bad journey, let me tell you so far. So I am totally as foreign educated as you can imagine. I hold degrees that appear like a perfect Christmas gift, like a perfect birthday gift, a perfect green wedding gift. Graduating class of 2020, your life will take you to places, 
perhaps to places where I have been or to new places, and I hope it will be a blessed journey you will have. After all the degrees that I have attained and the places I saw across continents, I come to you to share some, not all, I still have a lot more to live, hopefully, God blesses me with long life, to share today some of the lessons I've learned so far in my life's journey. The secrets and the defining moments that remind me of my place in the world and who I am among our blessed Naga community and an international community today. I will always be the little girl from Dimapur. My parents divorced in 1985 and I was oblivious of what would that mean for a small Naga girl growing up with a single mom in a Naga society. What it would mean to witness loved ones, parents, family members, relatives, and cousins struggle with addiction, with alcohol, with stigma, and domestic violence. Being ostracized for belonging to an alcoholic family and witnessing my mother always struggle to make ends meet would mean that as a young child, I wanted to escape into a place where I imagined things to be different. And I could do that only in my mind, where I was able to forget the reality that confined me as a child, as reject of a society where the standards and bars of a good family, a good mother, a good father, did not align with the reality I encountered every day. The bar and expectation that Naga society set for me as a little girl in Dimapur, Nagaland was the lowest one. I studied in Christian English school. I did my high secondary in Patkai before I left for Delhi. When I was studying as a child in Christian English school, I was a quiet student on the outside. But on the inside, I always felt I was not good enough. I took on the violence and shame and addiction I witnessed around me. I did receive, though, a lot of help from elders in the society. My uncles, neighbors, elders, and the society at large did an exceptional job of reminding me about the pathetic reality of my family and the gossips were never ending. When I was in class six, something happened. One day, there was a surprise essay competition in the class and the prize money was 10 rupees. Given how comfortable I was in my imaginative world as a child, I wrote a story and gave it my own. That following week, the teacher came in and returned our essay notebook. She said that the prize was inserted inside the pages of the winner's notebook. I sat in the second last bench in a class of around 50 kids. By the time the turn came for the backbenchers to collect their notebooks, more than half of the class realized that the prize was missing from their notebooks. Imagine, the excitement and the number of heads turned towards the backbenchers. That moment of excitement for finding the prize money was gone for many students in the class but I could see their faces and their eyes gazing in disbelief that someone among the back benchers would get that prize. When I got my notebook, I was nervous. I started checking the pages and my world stopped. I saw the prize, that 10 rupees note, and I felt, oh my, this does feel good. The 10 rupees in my hand, class six, that recognition. It was that moment that the fire of determination was ignited in my soul and in my heart as a child. I realized there were no rules that I needed to come from a good family to compete. I had discovered this secret and every time I scored well, I taught the subject, the class, oh man, did it feel good. Studying from a home where the filtered water always ran dry because there were parties who required more water than alcohol to fit into their glass. Or in the house where some drunk would come in and eat my lunch when I got back from school, gave me even more reason to escape into my books 
and the world I felt when I won the 10 rupees prize. Over the decades, I have competed and achieved fellowships and grants at an international and a national level. I got a full fellowship to study at Stanford University, and today I have zero student loan. And I found myself, as I became an adult, as someone who had a competitive spirit, but that increasingly made me unhappy. I only knew joy when I won, when I achieved, and that also meant that inside I was really miserable or becoming miserable over the years. One day not long ago, when I was a student, I visited the British Library in London for my research work. I photocopied some documents and carried it back to Northeast India. One day, a senior research fellow asked me if I would share some of the documents with him. I resented. Why should I? Why should anyone ask me for what was mine, what I had done, for what I had achieved, for documents from the British Library? I had worked so hard to get it. I had become this miserable, competitive, success-driven person. I wondered, who is this person? What are her values? What is her truth? And what is her meaning in life? As a scholar today, I attend many conferences, I give talks, I do workshops, I write books and articles that are considered as important by my peers in the academy and in the policy world. Today, I can do all that because I had to confront the truth about myself during a time that I would call the post-British library years. I had become attached to an illusion that success and feeling great was connected to moments of winning. This mirror of myself, the Stanford branded self and the miserable resentment self led me to a path of self-discovery. A journey of the self, of introspection, of purpose, of meditation, of meaning and of prayer of staring at my ego, looking into my pretensions, I saw the limits of success. The path to seek the truth made me realize that in life, we all reach a plateau. The bar that I had set as a little girl in class six in Dimapur had only got me so far. To grow up and tell my story that children from violent and alcoholic families can make it, and I still do that. And that's my reason why I'm such a strong advocate of violence against women, of gender violence, and of finding safe homes and spaces for children from violent uh, families. But I also realized that at every transition in our lives, we have to remap the meaning of our lives. I realized that it is not true that our desires and dreams are only as good as we are able to measure them. Today, when I wonder and imagine the meaning and purpose of my life, it is beyond degrees and the knowledge that I produce as a professional academic. I believe that instead of the spotlight and the limelight to which I'm not attracted anymore. I have begun to strive towards a floodlight, as bright and radiant as, as the star where every single of us share the joy and fellowship of working and walking together. Instead of letting brands like degrees and fashion coming from quote unquote good families of heritage families wear me and my identity. I believe that love, forgiveness, courage, and compassion are timeless and the most important brands for humanity to practice. Tetzel College graduates in class of 2020, remember the quest to discover that a life lived in the spirit and wisdom cannot be held within a finite bar or measure that every morning is a golden day filled with seconds, with minutes and hours to discover why we should strive to love, to serve, 
to speak for justice and work towards a world free of violence. That is a moment of the 10 rupee price. That is a moment to realize that the 10 rupee price has the ability to change someone's life forever. The meaning of who you are, the priceless life you possess right now today, the power of your youth and the potential you hold is immeasurable. Remember, seek a path that allows you to discover who you are. Meditate about the purpose of your life and never forget the power of your life, the story you hold in your hand. Tell them, tell them to the world with courage, with humility and with deep wisdom. Live wise and live well, graduating class of 2020. And May this Gallic blessings that I say now at the end of my speech be with you. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine upon your face. May the rains fields fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Thank you all and all the best for your journey. Thank you. Beautifully said, ma'am. You have come a long way from where you started. We could not have a more fitting commencement speaker than you. Thank you for sharing with us your experiences, your struggles, and your amazing journey. Thank you so much, Dr. Dolly Kikon. <laughs>